Say hi to everyone. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Ask them for the countdown. <laughs> Guys, you ready for the countdown? the nation to defund the police. To end policing as we know it. Off the charts violence in New York City. 11 people shot in just eight hours on this is Sunday. About the police officers, officers who every single day put on that uniform and they run towards danger when we run away from it. Well, what do we have here? Guns up. Hey, giddy up, y'all. This is uh, Night Shift on Failure to Stop. Failure to Stop is a family of podcasts, and we are a family of families. Uh, tonight is uh, Night Shift with the beautiful Andrea. I am Drew Breezy. I'm sitting in for uh, a fellow by the name of Eric Tanzi. We are not going to discuss Eric Tanzi's employment status with our network tonight. We shall in the very near future. Uh, Failure to Stop is a family of podcasts. Monday night is uncuffed with the aforementioned Eric Tanzi and Jay Durrell White. It's very funny. It's comedy based. This is Night Shift, and it is true, true crime because Andrea does a bunch of research on very intriguing cases. And generally, some dopey cop sits with her and chimes in. Uh, and that's my role tonight. Wednesday night, we have a show called Last Call, and that is with our man who, our star producer for tonight, Josh, who is uh, also known as Dead Lake Media on Instagram. He teams up with that other guy, Eric Tanzi, and they bring a uh, news-oriented show to you. Thursday nights is the what uh, some would refer to as the big show. Uh, some also that, would not. Some would not, but some would. And that is called the Com Center. If you want to reach the Com Center when it's not live, it's uh, 848 COM 911, 848 266 6911. Nice. And that is John. Difficult to look at pictures. John and I. And we go over all of your favorite 911 and police uh, activities. It's a show for dispatchers, firefighters, police officers first responders, and the civilian community to try to get them hooked into what we do. And then on Friday, we have what uh, what we'll call the flagship show, the big show. That is the namesake of this network, Failure to Stop. It is the Friday breakdown. That's myself again with the, the other guy, Eric Tanzi, who seems to do a lot for this network. Uh, Eric and I team up and we do, uh, we chime in and we uh, crack wise or break down very seriously and simply and comprehensively uh, police matters of the day. You don't want to miss it. You should take a look at our YouTube page anytime you want and join. You should take a look at our Patreon for all, uh, all of the extra content that's being put out there. John is on fire. Andrea is on fire. Josh is on fire. And John dropped a new episode about one of my favorite topics, me, tonight. So... <laughs> Make sure you go and listen to that. I have no clue what it is, and uh, I, I honestly can't wait to hear it myself. So without further ado, I'm probably just going to sit down and shut up because I know my place until I have to do some kind of ad read for Manscaped later because the show is brought to you by Manscaped. Uh, this is the very beautiful Andrea. Take it away. Hey, y'all. All right. So, yeah, we, again, there are a few new cases going on 
in the United States, but I'm not really touching on those. We don't have a lot of updates on the big stuff we've covered. Um, a couple of interesting things going on, though. The um, Dale, uh, the case of Dale Dinwiddie that went missing, the girl in, uh, outside of USC in uh, South Carolina, University of South Carolina. We have someone who wrote in who is actually from exactly that area. In fact, I believe if she wasn't mistaken, if you're in the chats, correct me. Otherwise, send me a message. But I believe her parents actually now live in the home that Dale's parents had lived in when this took place. And if you remember, it was a crazy story. And at the end of the day, it's, it was unsolved. And we know nothing outside of the fact that there happened to be a serial rapist and murderer that was uh, living in that vicinity at that time and committing other crimes. He's not been charged with this, but there's some similarities there. And then there was um, a prosecutor that was specially appointed uh, or, or this lawyer, excuse me, that was kind of, again, a South Carolina lawyer situation, big in town. Uh, and he had some ties to this and it looked a little interesting. He had some uh, run-ins with minors and other things. And it, my antenna was kind of up toward that guy's direction a little bit. And uh, one of our listeners actually wrote in to say that, like I said, her parents live in the home that Dale's parents had lived in at the time. And evidently there's some new information that's going to come out about that lawyer. Uh, it's kind of breaking now. So we, we've not heard yet what that's going to be. What is it with South Carolina and lawyers? And, uh, and I have to ask, I mean, this, this show tonight, I, I think, I don't want to steal your thunder, is, uh, takes place. It's a setting in South Carolina. It is. And, my question to the chats, uh, specifically Abby Uplate is, is in there, um, who teams up with hey, John Abby. quite frequently on, on uh, Patreon and, and teams up with you. Is South Carolina becoming the Florida of the United States? Uh, ponder and discuss. Andrea, it's back mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's going to come out of it. I think that's I think that's not – that culture is not long for this world. It's still here, and it's hanging on tight in South Carolina, but not forever and ever. <laughs> Right. Um, so that's one update. Uh, and that's pretty much all we've got in the sense of updates, but, um, let's talk about if you're new to the show, we go back no matter how serious of a case. And we go back to the year in which the crime occurred and talk a little bit about what happened that year. Again, Drew, I keep saying we need a, we need a pop culture intro, right? Like a pop culture. Pop, maybe a synthesizer. Right. Pop, what culture, happened maybe. in this what year? Happened? Yeah. This year, this year. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so this is going to be 1985. Uh, so the movie The Color Purple. Who saw that? I did. Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, but even bigger, Back to the Future began in 1985. Um. That's your two. That's that's some big ones. That's a big. There's not <laughs> would, a big uh, list in '85. I would add, from experience, Beverly Hills okay. Cop. Was I it believe, ni- Was '85? I would guess '84, '85. Yeah, I would guess. Well, if it's not '85, it's not going to be on my list. So it might okay. have been '84. I would name <laughs> it. I love that movie. Yeah. No, actually, this could just be a terrible list. I don't know. <clears throat> if but if it is, I would name it because I do love that movie. Um, music wise, we are the world, right? So this is when everyone got together to sing it. Drew, would you like to sing it or there comes a time when we heed a certain call, when the world must stand together as one Josh, it's your turn. Ah, oh, shit. No, he's not we messed up the timing. Yeah, he's, he's not needed. Yeah, he's needed. Oh, he's being so this is this included some artists such as Bob Dylan, Billy Joel, Ray Charles, Cindy Lauper, Lionel Richie, Kenny Rogers, Bruce Springsteen, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, on and on and on. Um, and they sing "We Are the World." This was the start of live aid concerts. Uh, this is when Nintendo Nintendo Entertainment System was first released. It was in eighty five. And, and I just wonder, and I don't want to give away anything, but I wonder if anybody in the chats knows anything about Nintendo. Continue, Andrea. The original, like like putting the cartridge through your shirt to like. That may be a little off. bit too inside. No, yeah, I guess <laughs> blowing off the cartridge yeah, yeah, before yeah, you put yeah. it in. Yeah, uh, there may be somebody with some more intimate knowledge of Nintendo. That's <laughs> all I'll leave. I'm going to leave it. At oh, that. okay. Interesting. Um, and this was the first year for actual blood testing for AIDS, where you could actually test blood to determine whether or not someone was positive for HIV or AIDS. 
Uh, this is when this is the year that Michael Jordan was rookie of the year. We're doing a lot of 1980s cases, so I like it because there's a lot of Jordan talk. Uh, so he was rookie of the year that year. Let's see here. Television debut. We have Growing Pains, Larry mm. King Live. I didn't realize that was 85. He had a couple shows though. He was on uh, CNN. Uh, he was, on, I believe, he was on uh, WRR, WOR in New York for a while, and then he, then he had the big show on CNN that that he was on uh, forever and ever and ever. Would you? So, was that on Fridays? I don't remember. I mean, if it were Fridays, it was the I was big out. Show. Let, let's be, you know, if it were Fridays, I was obviously out clocking hose. So I don't know. <laughs> Fridays. Hold on a I second. Thought Friday, this, I thought the, the big shows happen on Friday, so that's what I was. I didn't they know. all happen on Fridays. Fridays, I believe, in 1985 and maybe 1986, though, uh, were reserved for Miami Vice. And Ooh. when I was growing up, you watched Miami Vice on the TV and you played it on your home stereo, and that was the introduction of stereo. Oh yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I need you to wear a white sport coat next time we. Oh, I, I show promise. Together. Yeah, and a pink. Uh, undershirt sure we also yes we also have um macgyver and the golden girls goodness gracious that's thank good you stuff. for being a friend thank you uh the jeffersons actually ended they ended their 11 seasons holy cow 250 episodes um so here's an interesting one because we talk about uh what is good to talk about on the show or not eric recently did a whole segment on cancel culture with words and what you can and cannot say so yeah. 1985 was the first year that someone was allowed to use the word period um, on TV. And so it says instead, mysterious terms such as special days or that time of the month were used. Um, but this barrier was broken when Courtney Cox said the word period during a commercial for Tampax tampons in 1985. A very young Courtney Cox. That yeah. So, well, obviously very. of age, but yeah, young. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're not talking friends here. Uh, Courtney Cox, uh, what? I don't even know if she was on the TV show before Friends. I mean, Probably. she was in movies. Uh, yeah. She was, she was in, in that Bruce stuff. Springsteen video. I, I wonder if she was talking. If... She wasn't talking periods on Bruce Springsteen. She, I know? very much, I very highly doubt that. I wonder if this commercial was her her breakthrough moment. Oh, that's come on. I know you're <laughs> I didn't even sick mean jokes. for it to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I didn't even <laughs> uh time of the month humor is just not my thing, Andrea. <laughs> I didn't even mean for it to happen. Okay. Oh, that was good. All right. They found the Titanic. Well, whatever. They found the Titanic in 1985. Um, and Calvin and Hobbes made its debut. So there you go. Oh, and did you know Garfield was a huge fan of lasagna? I did. I didn't know Okay, that. I'm just checking. I don't even think that's 1985 or 86, but I just wanted to make sure. I'm not super sure. I wasn't a big fan. Neither was I, but I knew Garfield and Odie, his uh, sidekick. Yeah. The dog, that, like, the yeah. tongue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're moving right along. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this case is super interesting We've talked often about um, in a lot of our cases about profiling, and that's specifically something that definitely interests uh, me when we talk about these things, because we're talking about the behavior or the psychology behind why someone does what they do or how you can figure out who did it based on the, those things. Right. So uh, John Douglas uh, plays a part, a big part in this case. In fact, we're going to talk about it. This case caused him, he wrote a book based off of this case that he worked very closely alongside with, uh, and definitely developed the profile for the suspect. And, and we'll talk all about that, but this was, this case takes place back in, um, May 31st of 1985, uh, in a small area in South Carolina. It was Lexington County, South Carolina. Um, so, Sherry Smith is who we're going to talk about. Uh, Sherry was in her senior year of high school, uh, 17 years old at the time. She was, in fact, I think two or three days shy of her graduation. So school year's out. Like there, She's done. There's a picture of Sherry. We have her on the um, screen here if you're not watching. She's blonde hair, hair feathered out, as you would expect in 1985. Uh, yeah, I, I can speak from the 1986 graduating class that she, she would have been what we know as uh, – hot in 1986 looker. so like you know if that were her 1985 senior picture which is yep. 
you know, she was graduating in 85. I, I'd say she was probably pretty good looking, yeah, but she, she was, was a preacher's looking. daughter, she which was. indicates she's on one side of the scale or the other, if you know what I'm saying. Yes, exactly. And she was not on the wild side. So she, okay. um, Sherry aspired to be a singer. She and her family, uh, there are multiple pictures you can find of them. The sweet, sweet family. She has a sister and a brother. Her brother is not spoken about much in this case because he really just isn't He's relevant in the sense that, of course, he loves and misses his sister, but in terms of breaking the case, wasn't really a key figure, uh, nor nor did he need to be. Uh, but their family uh, was very involved in the church, uh, and you're you're going to kind of hear their involvement uh, with their spirituality play out as as the the story goes on as well, um, and how that's affected them or how they handled what happened. But uh, Sherry was a good girl. Like I said, she was uh, very close to graduating. She was going to go on a cruise the next week um, from the last time she was seen. And uh, Sherry did have diabetes, a pretty, I mean, it was treated, but a, a decently severe enough form that uh, she would, it would cause her to have excessive thirst, which would then mean excessive urination. But what that really means in time of this is uh, the really, um, she could be dehydrated very, very easily. So that's going to play out in, you know, if she's not in your care or not able to get to her medication, that would be very scary because things could go south for her pretty quickly. Uh, so this day on May 31st, Sherry had been away. She had come home. She was checking the mailbox. Their driveway was a bit long. So she kind of just pulled up to the mailbox, got out to check the mailbox. Well, mom and dad are home and mom, mom and dad's names are Hilda and Bob. Smith. So Hilda says to Bob, Oh, look, Sherry's home. And she kind of goes about her business. Bob kind of glances out the window, sees her car. Doesn't, you know, okay, great. She's home. A few minutes go by and she didn't come down, you know, she didn't come down the driveway and through the door. And then he kind of looks up again and her car is still up at the road, just like it had been, uh, her car, her driver's side door was open. So he, he didn't really, you know, he wasn't alarmed, but he wondered why she wasn't down there. So he gets in his car to kind of drive up their driveway to go check and to see what's up and he doesn't see her. And so he thought, okay, well, worst case scenario, maybe she had a bit of a medical emergency. Maybe she needed to go uh, into the woods, you know, and relieve herself like something was going on. It wasn't like her to not just come right on home. So he starts on foot through the wood line and pretty quickly was very alarmed. Any of this was outside of her behavior. Uh, it, she was known. He said that she'd just come in and say, you know, Hey dad, and give him a big hug every single day. And they were very communicative and just all the things. And I think right, right off the rip, the hairs were standing up on the back of his neck. He did not feel good about what was going on. If I can refresh your memory uh, real quick too. Another thing that, that kind of uh, triggered him that set him off was that there was a set of footprints from her car to the mailbox, but they terminated at the mailbox. They never made yes. it back to the car. Yes. Good point. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, oh gosh, such an eerie scene. Yeah. So he comes back to the home and tells mom, tells Hilda, like, you know, Sherry's not out there at all. I can't find her. He's, he's getting alarmed. And, uh, they just start making phone calls, uh, not to authorities at first. They at first are, you know, calling anyone she could have known anyone wondering why in the world she wouldn't have, uh, come home. And then they, they pretty quickly go on and call authorities. And, uh, and it was, you know, she was listed as a missing person, but they, they started to investigate as it was something more foul at this point, uh, pretty early on. So, <clears throat> excuse me. If, if I can for a second, Please. let's, let's, let's set the, let's set the family tone here. Can you imagine, and I'm, I'm not wishing this on you or anybody else, but uh, the frantic feeling like, listen, I, I got separated as a kid from my parents at the, at the fair, at the peach festival in Lewiston, you know, and I was in uh, a sheer panic, but I, yeah. I think my mom was even more panicked when we yeah. were reunited. And, uh, you know, I, I used to work a, a, a thing called the strawberry festival here in the, uh, plant city area. And it was the same thing. Like when kids get separated from their parents, it's, it's a harrowing moment for everybody, for the kid, for the, usually for the parent. And then there are times when you reunite, you reunite the kids and the parents and the parents start yelling at the kids, which is obviously the wrong thing to do. I mean, so I've just recently seen both. So last, last summer, and I'll make this brief, but last summer, just out of miscommunication, my youngest son and I got separated at the beach. 
it was Oof. nothing. He's he's a rules follower uh, out of my two. He's probably more of my rules follower. So I know if I tell him, okay, yes, you can go rinse your boogie board off, go to that beach access and sit on that bench. I'm going to pick up all this stuff. You know, I'll meet you up there. He's going to do it. He's not. My other son yeah. is more like me. Who's going to be like squirrel and just kind of, you know, <laughs> bones. Um, but if, if yeah, <laughs> or bones. <laughs> so if my younger guy's not where he tells me he's going to be, I'm, I am more concerned. And so uh, it doesn't, so we get stuff cleaned up, get up there, look where he's supposed to be. He's not there. So I think, okay, maybe he's still back at the sprinklers, not there. Kind of do the back and forth a few times, like just calm down, you know, and then I'm starting to get a little nervous because now on this boardwalk, it's pretty heavily packed. It was like mid tour season, just, you know, or the height of that. Uh, some questionable characters walking around I, and I'm getting real nervous now. And so I see a, a police officer walking by and I was like, Hey, I'm not trying to make a big deal of this. I'm sure it's fine. But you know, and he was like, no, we have, we need to call it in. We always do. So he does. But of course, even just hearing, and I think about these kinds of things, right. With these cases, even just hearing him say the words, you know, you know, hmm. whatever age male wearing this, hearing him say that talking yeah. about my child who I really didn't think anything horrible had happened to, but not knowing right. just hearing that put me on a whole different level of alarm. It's, Ultimately yeah. speaking, he was where he was supposed to be, or he was where he thought I had instructed him to go, oh. which way it, and he's just sitting there swinging. He's fine. Cause he didn't feel like he was, he didn't know that he was separated from me. I just, I couldn't find him, but the reaction or the release when I found him, I started crying. Cause I was all that adrenaline dumps. Right. Yes. Separately speaking, I was on the beach last weekend and we're sitting there and we're watching this kid who stumbles up, but then he starts to cry. I think he might've been maybe on the spectrum a little bit or some developmental stuff. Um, his reactions were not all completely what you would expect, but he starts to cry. And then you find out he can't find his mom. You know, I said, well, honey, where's your mommy? And so he starts to kind of point, he winds up pointing in the wrong direction that he can't, he had not come from the direction he pointed at uh, probably eight, seven, eight years old. Uh, long story short, the, the beach cruiser comes over, we talk for a while and <clears throat> the child did a wonderful description of what his mother was wearing. And, uh, because of that, we were able to find her eventually, but once she was found nonplus as though, uh, I mean, the kid was without her eyes on him for, I would say at least probably 10, 15 minutes, a long time, a long time. If you don't know where your kid is, particularly right. at, at water, um, and she literally like sees him, like they get together and then she walks away probably 15 steps in front of him the whole way back as though he like nothing, um, pretty checked out and that's sad. But yes, to answer your question, when I think about these kinds of things, it's, I can't imagine that initial frantic moment. And then even more so a few hours later when like maybe the frantic part kind of eases off and you kind of know that like, oh. okay, this is what we're. Okay, now this is what we're actually having to handle. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know, you know see, so, the, 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 um, the secret of the pastor, my brother was a, a Baptist minister for several years. I mean, the secret of being a pastor is you, you, you're you usually called to stuff like this. So you, you've got to like spiritually right. charge everybody around you and you've got to do, you've got to lead the prayer and you've got to stay positive and you've got to do all the rational thinking. I can't imagine it happening to you and you still have and to kind of be child. the cheerleader and, and you have to keep a foot in rationality yet at the same time you're probably an emotional wreck on the inside and like and then the whole family is going to feed off of that and they're going to read it you know read yeah. that and then I, like i feel bad for the little the little brother you say he probably doesn't talk much about it but i mean you know he's only two three years younger and like it's just those knots in the stomach and you know that feeling of dread like oh this is just not good like wh right. whatever's whatever's going to happen is just not good. It just, I'm trying to stay positive, but it's yeah. not good. I'm sorry. Go oh. ahead. No, don't be sorry. Please interject. Um, so moving forward, uh, a couple of days go by and it's, they've launched all the efforts they can to investigate this. And uh, one night in the wee early hours of the morning, their phone rings at the Smith home. And it's a man who is saying that, um, that he has Sherry. He is describing in detail what she is wearing. Uh, he even to down to like the color of bathing suit that she has on underneath her clothing. He's, I mean, they're very confident right off the rip that he, this guy's telling the truth. Um, he's not sounding threatening. He's not, uh, saying he's going to do anything to her. He's talking very calmly and just saying that I have her. And so, 
Authorities get a phone call from the Smith family around three, four o'clock in the morning, frantic, saying that they had gotten this phone call from him. And a little bit of time goes by. Uh, at that point, they called it the under sheriff, but the police there in, in that county in South Carolina contacted the FBI Behavioral Science Unit. They knew this is this is odd. Like we're getting a phone call from this guy. We got we got to figure something out. So the behavioral uh, analysis unit gets involved. They also decide to go on and wire the phones, tap the phones at the Smith home, thinking and hoping uh, that he would call again. Uh, and he, at this point, had already called a few times to to uh, the family. The first time he called that was not recorded because their phones were not yet wired, he had mentioned to the mom that she needed to be looking out. Well, first of all, he specifically requests Hilda, the mother. Um, nearly every time he calls, he will request her. And so he requested Hilda and he told her, you know, he asked her if she'd gotten the mail and told her that she could expect a letter in the mail. And uh, so when they say this, you know, technology is not like what it is now. We talk about that often. But when he says, you know, you'll be getting a, a letter in the mail and then I forget it feels like tomorrow or in two days. So uh, authorities get to that mail center uh, to try to intercept the mail immediately. They they do find a letter. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The letter has what is in Sherry's handwriting, and it's written and called the Last Will and Testament. Um, and it goes on to describe basically Sherry's last wish wishes, which we'll we'll put a picture up in a moment. But uh, the child was very upbeat. And she says like, I love you. Here it is here. I love you, mommy, daddy. Um, and she names her siblings. And she just talks about how she's going to be with her father now. Basically, you know, when, when she passes away, she's going to be with Jesus. She says, so please don't worry with an exclamation point. Um, something about my special time. Please don't be scared. Essentially like your lives can be okay. I don't want this to that poor child. I, I don't want this to ruin your lives. If something happens to me, I'm okay. It's okay. I love you so much. It was um, sickening uh, and terrifying, but that's the letter that they did intercept. So by now their phones are tapped. And like I said, he had called uh, two or three times. Uh, and so let's go on. Dawn answers. So Dawn is her older sister, Sherry's older sister. And we're going to talk quite a bit about Dawn. They look very similar. Dawn has the feathered blonde hair. There's a picture of Dawn. We got the blonde hair, blue eyes as well. Um, they, they really do seem like a super sweet family. And Dawn answers the first call. So uh, Josh, dead leg, if you could play number one for us. This will be the first call that's recorded uh, from the killer. I need to speak to your mother. Could I ask who's calling? No. Okay. Just... Okay, hold on just a second, please. Hello? Have you received the mail today? Uh, yes, I have. Do you believe me now? Well, I'm not really sure I believe you because I haven't had any word from Sherry. And I need to know that Sherry is well. You'll know in two or three days. Why two or three days? She called the search off. Tell me if she is well. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. So he goes on to say a little bit, just that, like, call the search off, call the search off. I will tell you, like, she's okay. At first he tells her, like, she's fine. I will tell you more later. There's just a lot of vagueness uh, and you'll, we'll talk a little bit about when he is specific, what he is specific about and maybe why, but at first he is pretty vague. So he just continues to say, <clears throat> excuse me, to call the search off. Please keep in mind that mother's tone, her daughter has been missing now for two or three days. She's gotten a letter in the mail that is deemed her daughter's last will and testament, but she has the behavioral analysis unit with her beside her because they had to hang on to this phone call for a long time. Um, I believe at the time it was 15 minutes. It was, it was a long time to be able to trace these calls. Go for it. Yeah. There's th th that was not an adage. Like in the old movies, you used to say, you know, you got to keep them on the line. Keep you got to keep them on the line. Yeah. Like now it's different. Trap and trace is completely different. It's, it's like, it's just basically computer based technology or internet based technologies. But back then 
they really did have to trap and trace the the call so you had to do it for a length of time and that was you know part of the instructions that they would give would be to keep him on the phone as long as you can and it, it sounds like in that conversation and maybe in some subsequent conversations we'll hear he knew exactly the time limit to cut that off like yeah. he, he was not uh he was not done when it came to that yeah yeah and we'll learn he's not dumb but i i just keep going back to that mom and how her voice wasn't even yeah. really wavering i mean just so strong to be able to that blows my mind. So after that first call, investigators did trace it to, well, they were, excuse me, they were able to trace that one. We're not going to hear the clips that I play are clips of certain conversations. So it's not the entire conversation. Um, so the investigators traced it to a payphone at a local shopping center. In fact, it happens to be the same shopping center that Sherry and her friends had been shopping at the day she went missing. So it's at a payphone there. Of course, by the time police arrive, uh, there's no one in sight. There's no fingerprints found, uh, nothing, no evidence to develop at that point. So a little after eight o'clock that night on, on that same night of that phone call, this man calls again, uh, of course, from a different phone. Again, we, we spoke on this. He's smart. You know, he knows what he's doing to a degree. Dawn, the sister, picked up the phone again. He again asked for the mother. Uh, let's go on and rig up number two, Josh, please. So he asked for mom to come to the phone, and this is what we get now. Pardon? I can't hear you. It's not very clear. Speak louder. Did you receive the letter today? Uh, yes, I did. Tell me one thing it said. Tell you one thing it said? Anything. Uh, uh, Sir Richard? Do what? There was a little heart on the side, Sir Richard, written on the side. Oh, uh, it says... How many pages? Two pages. Okay, it was a yellow legal pad. Yeah. And on one side, on the front page, it said, Jesus is love. No, God is love. Well, God is love. Right. Okay, so you know now... So... He's saying, uh, basically, you know now that that is the letter that Sherry wrote. Like, now we have confirmed that we, we both have seen the same piece of paper. I'm not messing with you. He needs to, like, continue uh, to reiterate to her that he's that he legitimately has her. And the mom continues to say, I believe you. Like, I know that you do. But he has to legitimize it um, at every turn. So he keeps explaining how serious he is. Uh, Hilda will agree and say she understands that everyone is taking this very seriously. Uh, he's asking uh, for the search to be called off continually because he says that they're looking in the wrong place. And that's what he'll keep saying to her. Just tell him to call off the search. They're not looking in the right spot anyway. Tell him to call it off. They're in the wrong place. It's starting to bother him. So keep that in mind. He he's you know, he definitely seems to need a some control of the situation that he's not getting when he sees them. What he would probably consider kind of willy nilly. Right. Uh, looking in the wrong in the wrong place. Um, so, Josh, if you'll play the third number three, please. Okay. Forget Lexington County. Look in Saluda County. Do you understand? Look in Saluda County. Exactly. Uh, the closest to Lexington County, within a 15-mile radius right over the line. Is that understood? Yeah. And, please, and very, very soon, get... Please, now Sherry's request, Sherry say, uh, request, please, uh, no strangers, hardly, and when y'all, when we give the location. No strangers, absolutely. Okay. Now, did you understand about the folding of the hands, like she was in prayer in case something happens to us? Yes, if something okay. happens to y'all, but right. nothing, listen, nobody is going to harm you, I well, promise you that. Sheriff Mitch, I don't know what the problem is. I told you to forget about looking around your house. Okay. Saluda County. It, listen, there Do are, you believe me now? I believe you. There are so many people I know that, that love Sherry, and they just won't give up. Sherry, they I just want to tell you one other thing. Look. I want to tell you one other thing. Sherry is now part of me. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, our souls are one now. Your souls and, are one now with Sherry? Yes, and we're trying to work this out. So please... Do what we ask. You haven't been doing that. I don't understand. And she doesn't. We sit here and watch TV. We see no sheriff. We Why doesn't Sherry Sherry talk to me? She she knows me so well. 
That's why she asked me to communicate but, with you, not your husband. Aren't you aware of that? Yes, I know that. I, I know that she, okay. she would and, ask and you to talk with me. she does love y'all. And like she said, do not let this ruin your lives. We're not going to let it ruin okay, our lives. Well, but it, you not. tell, listen, you tell Sherry one thing. What is right? There's no way my life could ever be, have any happiness in it again if, if Sherry left this world with me bearing a guilt that I, I had failed in such a bad way because I love her and I, I want to make her happy. I'll do anything no, to no. work it out. She doesn't have to come home, okay? okay? I'm serious. She does not have to come home. Anything. Well, time's up, and uh, please now uh, have the ambulance ready at any time. This at any will time. not go any further, and uh, it will be soon. The ambulance, you're not telling me that no, something's going to happen to her, and I'm going to have to have an ambulance. I'm telling you, her condition is getting bad. Is that you what you're You know more about it than I do. I know I do, and that's why I am so well, worried you about the it. And I'll give you the location and tell Sheriff Mitt to get all his damn men and salute a county. Okay, well, God bless all will of you. Will you call me soon? I will. will you call me back tonight? I, I just need reassurance to know that she's still I have okay. To be careful. I got to go now, and listen. Uh, Will please, you? please, please forgive me for this. It just got out of hand. I know. Listen, do me one thing. What is that? Hurry. Just tell Sherry. I know she knows how much I love her. Tell her her daddy loves her, and her daddy will work anything okay. out with her under the sun, and, and he admits we've got a lot of problems, and we'll, we'll work them out, and her brother and sister love her. And okay. God bless you for taking care of my baby. Sherry is protected, and like you said, she is a part of me now. Mm. Okay. So lots to unpackage there that red flags abound in that call. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, so he's starting to anger. If you can't tell that, right. His, 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 he's clipped with his verbiage. Now he's getting a little frustrated. Um, but his comments about Sherry being one with him, I feel like we all come to the you know same idea there that that can't be good. Like that can't right. be good. Um, it's a very bad sign. And and he's acted, you know, he's acting like he got what he wanted from them becoming one. Like now it's like he doesn't have time for all the rest of this mess because it's like he's almost satiated whatever it was that he was desiring. Um, Hilda did a great job keeping him on the phone. Um, go ahead. Were you going to say something, Drew? No, 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 no. Keep okay, going. okay, okay. Um, so this time they were able to actually trace the call to a payphone um, only eight miles away. Uh, not far at all. Again, same old song and dance. Of course, he's gone by the time they get there. There are no fingerprints. He knows what he's doing there. Uh, so they send all this. So I misspoke earlier. They they did get in touch with the behavioral analysis unit prior to this. And local deputies did wiretap their phone, which is how we have these recordings. At this point, though, behavioral analysis was not particularly uh, investigating it or listening to the phone calls until now. So now they take the recordings that they have and send it over to the FBI, to the, to the BAU. Uh, and this, the lead on this case is the one, the only John Douglas. So we've talked about him before. Again, uh, if you, if you ever watched a red mine hunter, uh, <clears throat> and John, like I said, uh, eventually wrote a, wrote a book based on this case specifically. So now there's a John Douglas interview that we're going to listen to where he speaks on it a little bit. He talks a little bit about what he's going to do in order to profile and, and what he thinks this looks like uh, from his point of view and his expertise. So if you play number four, Josh, Josh. You don't perpetrate a crime like this uh, when it's uh, and this, as your first crime. You definitely, it shows too much planning, control, uh, how he's able to get this victim away from that mailbox and control her. Uh, so he has will have a, a criminal history. What kind of criminal history? It generally it starts off as uh, peeping Tom, uh, obscene telephone caller, and then as he get older, there will be attempted attempted assaults, uh, uh, maybe similar to the, what we're what we're looking at here. So what's helpful will be. Um, <clears throat> that one cut off. Uh a little abruptly, but he's, he's just talking about the fact that this guy seems too experienced. He seems too confident for this to be the first time he's done something like this. So likely you're looking at someone who has had some sexually motivated crimes, 
maybe not rape and murder, right? But something to lead him up to this point. Like he said, maybe a peeping Tom. Uh, he actually wrote a book entitled When a Killer Calls about this case. I've not read it, uh, but now I actually really, really want to. Uh, and he goes into a de detail, detailed description of what he thinks the killer would be. So I'm going to read to you here what he says. And he says he was no amateur. Um, he was a fair, fairly criminally sophisticated and educated streetwise. You don't start off with this type of a case. You would have a history of other sexual assaults and possibly abduction attempts. Uh, this was when John Douglas was interviewed on a and E true crime. He said, people like this have trouble in interpersonal relationships. He's probably been married, but is likely divorced. Generally crimes like this are intraracial. So meaning white on white, for example, um, also he had some kind of electronic device that enabled him to disguise his voice, indicating a background in electronics. Uh, he says, as far as age, I usually start at age 25 with this type of a violent crime, but here we have an abduction at a mailbox in broad daylight on a Friday. That's pretty risky. That's bold. So we start adding years. Uh, he was 35. We would think somewhere in the thirties. And in fact, I think that the, the man in question was actually 37 at this time. So that was pretty, pretty spot on. Um, he says he's going to be narcissistic by nature. He also has to be in control. And we're hearing that in these phone calls. They think he's using that voice changer, like we said, because his words are so garbled. He sounds like Jodie Foster. Uh, <laughs> so they believe he likely works in the electrical field or maybe a contractor. So they've said pr probably electrician or contractor at the end of the day. And this would also make sense because he's kind of all over town all the time when he's making these calls, not sitting like in a cubicle somewhere. Uh, detectives know that uh, if the family is all over the news, he is going to be more likely to reach out. He's showing us that behavior, right? So uh, he, he can't help it at this point. He has to be in control of the situation. So they go on and hold a press conference uh, and they sit back and kind of wait. And, of course, he calls. So, Josh, if you'd like to play number five, please. Dawn? Yes? Uh, this is Sherry Faye's request. Have your mother get on the other phone quickly. To get on the other phone. Get on the other phone, mother. Get a so that was the sister. Get a pencil ready. and paper ready. Okay. Okay. I She's know. not on the phone yet. Well, I'll tell you this. Okay. Uh, you're aware that... That was in Sherry's own handwriting. Yes, I am. All right. Okay, now this is Sherry's own word. Okay. So listen carefully. Say nothing unless you're asked. Okay. Okay. And it's not necessary. I know these calls are taped mm -hmm. and traced, but that's irrelevant now. There's no money demanded. So here's Sherry Faye's last request. On the fifth day, to put the family at rest, Sherry Fay being freed. Remember, we are one soul now. When you locate, when located, you locate both of us together. We are one. God has chosen us. Respect all past and present requests. Actual events and times. Jot this down. Hurry. All right, I'm doing it. 328 in the afternoon, Friday, 31st of May. What? Wait a minute, too fast. 328 in the afternoon. Sherry Faye was kidnapped from your mailbox with a gun. She had to fear God on her, and she was mm. at the mailbox. That's why she did not return back she to her car. She had to fear what? Fear God. Fear God. Okay, 458 a.m. No, I'm sorry, hold on a minute. 310 a.m. Saturday, the 1st of June. Uh, she hand wrote what you received. 458 a.m. Saturday, the 1st of June. Okay, Saturday, the 1st of June, 458 a.m. Became one soul. Became one soul. What does that mean? No questions now. All right. Last. Between 4 and 7, Wednesday, tomorrow, have ambulance ready. Remember, no service. Four and, wait, 4 and 7 a.m.? 4 and 7 in the afternoon. In tomorrow. the afternoon. Tomorrow. Okay. Okay, have ambulance ready. 
remember her request, no circuit. Okay. Prayer and relief coming soon. Please learn to enjoy life, forgive. God protects the chosen. Sherry Spade's important request. Rest tonight and tomorrow good shall come out of this. And please, to our sheriff Mets, search no more. Blessings are near. Remember, tomorrow Wednesday, 4, to, 4 in the afternoon to 7 in the evening. Ambulance ready, no circuits. Okay, no circuits. What does that mean? We'll receive last instructions for to find us. Please okay. forgive. Don't, do not kill my daughter, please. I mean, please. We love and miss y'all. Get good. Okay. Woo wee. So the more I listen to that, the less it sounds like a voice changer to me than almost like he's just trying to talk with his teeth gritted, but closed. I, I think he is. I, I think there is some kind of apparatus involved, though. I think he's moving the pitch up and down. I think he's, I think he's turning from his voice on his own as well. But I mean, I think he's, Yeah. I, I think there is, because the pitch is uh, is changing too. Like it's going Ooh. really high pitch as opposed to him. Right. Uh, using, using, so, you know. We know that that call is very ominous. Um, all the things he's saying. I mean, everything, nothing sounds like this girl would be alive. We, we all know that, right? So, uh, but he also this time, interestingly enough, used Sherry's middle name, Faye. And, and no one called her by that. No one in her family, none of her friends did. And John Douglas will say later that he, his thoughts on that is just, it's one more way that this man can make himself feel like he's closer to Sherry than other people are. It's almost like he's ingratiating himself upon like that. He's making their relationship something that it's not and closer than it is with her and any of her other friends and family. Um, so he's now given a lot of specifics. He's telling them times and dates and when to be where. If you noticed a lot of people in the chats have said, it looks like he sounds like he's reading off of something. He 100% was, yeah, he was reading scripting. a script. Yeah. And in fact, when he made a mistake, he says, Oh, but sorry. And it goes back to the beginning. Um, so, but again, that, that points toward his meticulousness, his control. He is organized. He's not doing anything fly by the seat. So he has to read off the script. He d Did you notice that he doesn't like it when she asks questions? He gets really flustered when she tries to get him to respond. He needs to just tell her how it's going to be. Right. Um, so they just hope that he calls again because there's not really else. I mean, obviously they're searching and investigating, but he's the one that they kind of think is going to provide the information they need. So they wait for him to call and he does. So let's go on and play number six because we don't have a whole lot more of these calls, but they're pretty interesting in how this plays out. Number 103, go one quarter mile, turn left at white frame building. Go okay. He's uh, he's specifically describing, I, I think he says Moose Lodge. I thought it was a Masonic Lodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've uh, heard, I've heard Masonic Lodge. Yeah, VFW, Moose Lodge, all of it. But it's in a rural area, 378. I, so the weird thing is I was stationed in South Carolina uh, just after this. I think I got there in 87. Okay. But th 378 runs, you know, like I was in Sumter, which is just east of Columbia. Lexington is in Saluda are like south and west of Columbia. Um, but 378 is a very popular kind of route. Or, is it 376 or 378? But either way, whatever he just said is a kind of a popular um, east-west route through South okay. Carolina. So uh, he gets those specific instructions. Like that's why he keeps saying you knuckleheads are looking in the wrong. You got to be looking in Saluda County, um, mm -hmm. which is south of where everybody is kind of searching for or where she's from. And right. then she gives, he gives those specific directions to the to the rear of that um, either moose lodge or masonic lodge yeah and if you notice too again with his tone it's changed again now it's just orderly and specific like very staccato it's bullet points this is where you're going to go down to the steps you're going to take this many steps the, the audio might have caught out a little bit before that but he says uh, 
you know, this many steps off the road when you get out of your vehicle. Like, so he has got this down to a science and he's ordering them this. So of course, number one, they track the call. They go to where he's calling from and they don't, he's not there immediately. They've also deployed a helicopter to go to the area that he, uh, that he was distinguishing. The helicopter does see what looks like a body pretty quickly in the wood line behind that, uh, Masonic lodge. They get there, uh, and confirm, rather quickly that this is actually Sherry Smith. Uh, the clothes are exactly the same as the clothes the girl was wearing when she was abducted. Um, there, these days, it was an absolutely incredibly hot month of May for South Carolina in this year. So it was over 100 degree days for all of these days. So at this point, I think it's been five or six days that she's been gone. Um, and so decomposition has quickly set in. I mean, this even impacted their search and rescue a little bit with these, with this heat. People were trying to take a bit more um, shortened shifts there. So um, it was clear, like I said, that it was, that it was Sherry. The coroner believed that she had likely been there pretty soon after, w since within 12 hours of her abduction, uh, which was a few, quite a few days prior, the heat uh, increased the speed of her decomposition. And so initially a cause of death was not able to be determined. Uh, there were some tracks nearby, but that was about all. There was, I think, some broken branches and whatnot and some tire tracks. So it looked to be uh, pretty straightforward that a vehicle, uh, likely like a truck, had pulled in, dragged the body to where it was found, you know, and pulled right back out. And that was pretty much it in terms of the scene and evidence. There wasn't really a whole lot to evaluate um, and and study there. So they did conduct an autopsy later on that same day. The assumption was that she was in some way asphyxiated um, or could have died from dehydration due to her diabetes. I think we've learned now that very likely she was strangled. Um, but like I said, again, decomposition had set in pretty, uh, pretty majorly at this point. She did have bruising around her wrist and ankles indicating she had been bound. They'll later say that there was um, some remnants of duct tape on her face um, and her hair had actually been cut where it had been, was probably sticking under the tape there. So they, um, so, I'm sorry, I said strangled. He has been known to do this. We'll talk about this, but with her, I think that it was more of the suffocation with the duct tape around her yeah. face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, like I said, she had the bruising around her wrists and ankles uh, they had not at that time been able to determine whether or not she had been sexually assaulted. So with this call, he directed the authorities to exactly the same spot or exactly the spot she would be found. Um, and I mean, when he talks about the number of steps it would take to reach her body on foot from a vehicle, that tells me something. Probably he's been back right? He's, he's probably revisited this. And, and John Douglas says just that he's, he's probably, uh, not probably he m most certainly has multiple times gone back to the scene sure. of this crime or where he deposited her body. Um, anytime, John, if you have anything to say, or Drew, if you have anything to say, please. <laughs> please tell the only me. thing I have to say is never call me John again. Uh, he is <laughs> thinking of John he, Douglas. If, he uh, is obviously, <laughs> um, He's obviously feeding off the power of this whole thing. So he's, yeah. uh, he likes the, uh, you know, I don't, th there's a huge spoiler I could give right now, but I won't, I won't, I won't be the John of the chat in live form, but he, uh, he likes making these kind of appearances. Like uh, I'm right under your mm -hmm. nose as you idiots. Basically. He does. He does. And they know that he's going to have to reach out. Right. So, now that the news story has broken about her body being found because it was pretty um, like, you know, right, right when it happened immediately, the news is all over this. And so they sit back again and wait because they know he can't, he can't help himself. If, if they found her body and it's on the news, he's going to have to reach out. Um, he does. So at 8 57 PM, the day after she was found, he called um, something changed though. This time he asked to talk to Dawn. He's never asked to talk to Sherry's sister before. He's always, in fact, Dawn's always answered and he's asked to speak with her mother, Hilda. So uh, this time he asks specifically to speak with Dawn and it goes a little sideways. So you're going to have to listen really closely. This is a, a pretty quick clip, but we're going to go on and play number seven, Josh. This thing got out of hand and all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. I That was kind of crucial. 
uh, so in that call, he, uh, he, he is talking to the bigger sister of, uh, the victim and her name is Dawn. And he says something to the effect of, uh, listen, you know, things just got out of hand and all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn and blah, blah, blah. And she stops him dead in his tracks and says, excuse me. What did you say? Mm -hmm. What did you say? And, or to who, or something to that effect, you're, you know, and, he says, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And and he corrects himself. Uh-huh. Um, so it's showing, well, what's it showing to you? What, what's it kind of giving to you? Well, it, it's looking like th- this guy's not slipping up. That's what we've been talking about. He is meticulous. He's very ordered. He's very calculated. He's not going to accidentally say the sister's name if he was so fixated on Sherry. That murder has happened and it's gone now. It's out of his system And now the concern for the BAU and then what Drew and I are talking about now is that his fixation has now moved on to Dawn, the sister. Um, That is the concern. He's got a set of eyes on that house and that family and he's making phone calls and he's got he's got them wrapped around his finger, even though law enforcement is fully involved at this point. Correct. And so now to answer some questions I saw in the chats, uh, the the BAU is with the family most of the t- almost someone from them is is with the family most of the time anticipating these phone calls. They need to help the family know what to say back, how to keep them on the line, to get any pertinent information that they can. So when he's like Drew said, he just said, "I'm so sorry." And Dawn is saying, "What did you do? Like, why did you do this to my? Si- why did you have to kill her?" I think actually that's what she said. Why did you kill her? And he said, "I'm sorry. It just got out of hand. It got out of hand." And he said, all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. And like Drew said, she immediately is like, well, what? What did you say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sherry. All I meant to do was make love to Sherry. I didn't mean I I didn't mean to do this. It got out of hand. So this goes on for a while. But they needed Drew. They needed Dawn to keep him on the line because he had at this point started to threaten suicide. Uh, and they were terrified that there were a lot of things they were never going to find out if he did that, of course. And so they wanted to apprehend him. So they get her on. I mean, this, this girl has, her sister's body has just been found in in a terrible kind of way. Uh, and just don't let that be lost. You know what I mean? When you're hearing this, that she's talking to this man and being so strong and, and able to have this conversation again, blows my mind. I've heard, I didn't hear this on a lot and I didn't read about it a lot. I did read one article that does say that um, in this conversation and we don't have a clip of it and I'm fine with that. But in this conversation, he was very specific with Dawn as to what he did with her sister Hmm. Uh, and, and, and the kinds of things he did with her sexually. So there's that. Um, But now they are concerned that his fixation has switched to Dawn. They get to, I mean, they're now concerned for her safety and and rightfully so. So he finally starts to give a little bit more information as the call goes on. Can we play number eight? Uh, Josh, is that available? I am a family friend. That's the sad part. You are. Okay. Um, So he said uh, during this call, he just says that he is a family friend. Uh, and he just said, I'm a family friend. This is why I can't go around y'all. I can't be there. Uh, you'll know it's me. I'm a family friend. He goes on and on kind of right off the rip. The BAU does not believe that he is a family friend when I think that this would actually for a lot of people and maybe a lot of, uh, authorities, I don't know, sounds like it could be a wonderful lead, right? Like, Oh my goodness. Like that narrows our pool down a lot. But he's saying, no, no, almost in the same vein of him using Sherry's middle name earlier on, this is another ploy to sound closer to Sherry than he really was. By saying he was a family friend, puts himself in the situation a lot more than he actually was. Um, he wasn't anything in Sherry's life. And in his world, he was all the, everything. Uh, so he does continue to say that. Uh, so then he says... Sorry. Um, so at this point, he reveals a little bit more about his time with Sherry. Uh, as he did he did describe a sexual assault to her, um, but he calls it consensual. Uh, the way he mm. describes it to Dawn is that, uh, that these are the things that I did, and it was consensual. This is also what Sherry wanted. We know that not to be true. He revealed much more. Um, so, uh, Dad, can you just throw in the chats? Are we done with the – so I don't keep referencing them. Are we done with uh, this audio or no? I'm not sure why it's 
because I'm not sure. now we're going to come up. Hello? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure why. It's cutting off like the last five to seven seconds of every one of these. It's a StreamYard okay. thing. That's fine. Um, okay. So then we have another call where it's only 15 seconds long. And he, at this point, is saying that he gave her a choice. He's saying, you know, um, don't, it, she's okay. She's good with this. Uh, I gave her a choice of how she would die. And I think he offered her um, to be shot, to be poisoned, and I think maybe to be suffocated. And he's saying that she that she chose the way that she died. He's almost comforting or trying to comfort the family, it sounds, when he says this, uh, that essentially Sherry was in compliance with all of this, and this is what she picked. Uh, incredibly sick. Um, but he has to, but immediately again, I think we all can assume he probably didn't give this girl a, a, a choice without knowing why we don't believe that. I, I have the feeling uh, the the way he was setting this up, like the the previous conversations, the way he was talking, and the way he was setting this up, it almost sounded like he got what he wanted, and he was gonna he had already killed her. He was gonna kill himself. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they were gonna find both bodies. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what he I said. Yeah, to get an ambulance it. for us. Yeah, and and pray nothing happens to us on the way, and this is where you'll find us, and blah blah blah. So <clears throat> I was thinking he was headed in that direction but obviously he changed his mind at some point but i mean it was already too late mm -hmm. as far as sherry's concerned but right <laughs> excuse me the mm -hmm. last seven seconds of my audio is is uh cough right, go <laughs> cough ahead. cough cough well so they uh and they also don't believe he gave her a choice uh behaviorally because we know he has to be in control and he showed yes. that at every point. So he would not give her the option of knowing how she, or picking how she's going to die. Uh, he wouldn't put it in her hands at all. This call was actually tracked to a truck stop about 50 miles away. Um, and of course he wasn't there when they got there. So on June 8th, they hold Dawn's funeral. Uh, they're almost certain that the, the killer is going to be there. I, I mean, he has to be right. So they kind of make it, and it sounds terrible, but they kind of make it um, a spectacle on purpose because they know that they can anticipate looking for him, looking for someone of suspicion. They even take a stuffed animal, a koala out of Sherry's room and put it kind of like like on the outskirts of the out there in the funeral, thinking that maybe it would be picked up by someone because someone would want a trophy. So they do all these things, but the funeral I, comes and goes. Hmm? I really, w I wonder if they put like a big, like, um, cage with like a, a mouse string trap attached. Like yeah. <laughs> and then put the koala underneath. And then there's just like an agent, like a live trap, an like a live release. Yeah. He's, he's like dressed as like an undertaker and he's just like waiting for the guy to come. You know, I, I do have this observation though, that I want to discuss, um, mm -hmm. Her, her last will and testament, like the whole thing was well written, like as in grammatically perfect. And mm -hmm. even if you'll notice the title is capitalized in all the right places mm -hmm. and um, it's all, you, you know, I, I, and he forced her to put the time on there mm -hmm. at 3, 10 or whatever. But does any of that give any indication to you that she was in duress when she wrote that? In other words, was she, does that, doesn't that, like Josh, maybe you could throw that handwriting up there. Doesn't it appear that this is just a normal 17-year-old girl's handwriting? It's not a scared 17-year-old girl's handwriting. You know what I mean? Like you it would think does, that she but, would be, you know, freaked out. But Liz, but but also keep in mind her mother and her sister and the way they were able to carry out these phone calls. You're a thousand percent right. She maybe she was at peace. With I think her, she had, everything. I think she was absolutely terrified. He even said that when and now granted, he can make himself sound more important than he is. But he said, I abducted her at the mailbox with a gun and she had the fear of God in her. I'm sure she's terrified. Yeah, of course. Right? I, I don't, I, I don't, uh, I definitely don't doubt that she was terrified. I, I like, I'm not questioning that. No, but, no, yeah, no, I know that. I, I'm just saying it's more of a um, testament like, to her. Yeah, a testament to her, or maybe, but she, or she's just like she she's thinking I'm going to get through this one way or another. I'm, I've already I already know what's going to happen if the worst happens because right. I've made peace with the Lord. But if not, maybe, like let me maybe, just keep it cool. And I head. also think that you know in these situations 
I think, okay, the little I know about Sherry, not everyone would be able to think outside of themselves this much, particularly a teenager. I could see her knowing she's about to die, but also wanting to comfort her family. Like, yes. As, yes. as best as she possibly can. Unselfish. And that's what these, right. these exaggerated um, exclamation points and hearts and I'm going to be just fine. Right. I think that speaks to her trying to comfort them in that moment. Right. Or not wanting right. to leave them her very last thing with something terrible. And, but, and that's a point he kept stressing. He kept mm, saying mm -hmm. like, you know, she wants you to, you know, not be upset about this or she live with this. She loves you. Or, yeah. She loves you. Like, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. So um, the funeral came and went. And again, someone in the chats made the comment that it doesn't mean no one was there. Of course, he could have been there, but no one aroused suspicion. No one caused concern that was at the funeral. Uh, so so who's to say? But but it, it like I said, it, it came and went. Um, but later that day, he calls again. This call doesn't really reveal a whole lot, except for maybe he seemed frustrated to not be in control at this point. And so Dawn, what happened was Dawn kind of flipped the script on him and he, she starts asking him questions and she's saying, where did you kill my sister? And he doesn't really answer. And she asks again. And then he just tells the County he's not specific and she's pressing um, over and over and over. And he starts to get flustered and you can tell he's been reading off this script and he's been controlling the narrative. And now that he's not, he's, he's getting angry and, and very frustrated uh, and so this call was traced to an area about 60 miles away. Again, he was not there. Some days go by and no more calls come in and police keep Sherry's picture and story present in the news for, you know, under the hopes that he will continue to communicate if he continues to see stories about her. Um, but let's move over. I think I believe I just said that her funeral was on the 8th of June. So now it's June 14th. It's one county over. Yeah, but didn't he, did he call her on the 8th or the 9th? Did, wasn't there a subsequent phone call? Maybe. Uh, Which one are you thinking of? I have a million of them here, but I think the one I was thinking. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go. Oh, well, the one I was thinking of was just the one where she, where the sister keeps saying, where did you kill her? And he well, wasn't answering. But he also admitted that he was in attendance. He was there. He was at oh, the I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So it turns out he was at the funeral, and and I guess law enforcement took a, a jiding for that because mm -hmm. they could have picked him out, but they didn't. And and they had basically the description that the behavioral assessment unit had given, and um, right, whatever happened happened. Which which he fits to a T, and we'll talk about that as well. He he fits that description. Um, I, I can't imagine this guy blending in at least um, like emotionally or socially blending in, uh, yeah. you know, he can, he can put on a suit, but I don't see him looking, looking, you're acting the part. Sure. Uh, so on June 14th, like I said, one County over uh, the same investigators get a call that a little girl named Deborah Helmick was taken from her front yard. Uh, she lived in a trailer park there in the county. It was just after 4 p.m. Again, broad daylight. She was outside. We've got a picture of Deborah up on the on the screen. She's uh, similar in appearance in terms of the same, you know, blonde feathered hair. She also you can't tell in the picture. She also does have blue eyes. But Deborah was nine years old. She was outside playing uh, with a couple of younger siblings. Her dad was inside. I will tell you that as much as we've talked about Sherry and her family, and we know a lot more detail on them, we don't know a lot of detail on Deborah, uh, and, and never, never have learned that. And so, uh, not to be remiss in saying that we're not speaking on her personally or her family, which there's not that much information about them out there. So, uh, they get a call though, that little Deborah Helmick was taken from her front yard just after 4 PM. Like I said, uh, a silver sedan evidently pulled up and a tall white man got out. Evidently he literally grabbed her, threw her in the car and drove off. Just I think it was the the little brother that described him. Like was. he saw the whole thing go down. Yeah. And another, she was only nine. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Only nine. And so just another distressing, you know, an entire family ruined basically, mm -hmm. you know, off of this guy's behavior. Yeah. And so in little Deborah doesn't in 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 one in a lot of ways she does match the victimology of Sherry Smith, but in one big way she doesn't, and it's that she's nine. So yeah, generally these yeah. 
Yeah. Generally, these offenders are strictly kind of prepubescent because that's what they want um, or post pubescent. It doesn't often go back and forth like that. Um, but outside of that, everything else fits the scene being broad daylight. Her uh, she was blonde and blue, um, all of these things. So. um Excuse me. So immediately investigators, of course, ramp up. I mean, this 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 was a big search from the get go. The minute they get the call, a helicopter was deployed in the area looking for the vehicle that was described by the little brother. Um, some detectives initially thought that since this guy didn't call Deborah's family, maybe it was like a copycat and not like the same guy because they had received these phone calls. Now, I will say Deborah's family did not have a phone. They did not have a home phone. So who's to say if he would or wouldn't have called if the opportunity was available? Uh, but it, he didn't. It, it was a distance hmm. away too, wasn't it? It was a was it? It wasn't in the same. I think it was around. City. I want to say twenty miles from oh, okay. from Sherry's family. Yeah, it was like okay. one county over. So not too too far. Right. Um. So. But John Douglas immediately disagreed and said that he knew Sherry's killer would not stop. So he knew he was like this guy's on a roll. He's not going to stop abducting and murdering. And so this almost certainly has to be him. So he believed that since he hadn't been calling Sherry's family, he must have at this point started to shift his fixation again. Right. So at this time it was to little Deborah. So they're not gaining ground. They go back to square one and now they have to use Sherry's family to try to get in communication with him because now that his fixation has been on Deborah and he got her He's not interested in talking to Sherry's family anymore. So uh, they do this and they hold a graveside memorial service uh, for Sherry and they use props again like that koala and they announce that this is going to take place, this graveside service. So once the announcement on the news comes out that there's going to be this graveside memorial after the fact, um, sure enough, he calls, uh, he gives information he gives excuse me um he talks to dawn so john douglas was at the house when he called this time he was anticipating this call he told dawn uh that she was going to have to stall for time and so now they're using dawn as bait uh and and the family knows this and dawn knows it uh and so he calls and says this time though um unfortunately we don't have the audio but there's there's no voice changer now he's speaking in plain voice uh, again, though, it's like that urge was satiated with Sherry and so it's like he's released that like he's moved on. And so he can talk to them kind of normally now, it sounds like. Um, so he's now getting almost like a little uh, reckless. His tone is getting concerning. This is about the time that he's starting to tell uh, Dawn that. Uh, if I remember correctly, that like, basically, well, you have to go outside sometime. I know where you live. Like you can't be protected all the time. He's starting to ramble a little, uh, and just again, show some very concerning behavior, uh, toward authorities. Um, but then he immediately started giving, but then he says, Oh, Hey, as he's about to get off the phone. And he said, have you heard about little Deborah Helmick? And that's what they had been waiting to hear. And immediately mm -hmm. when he says it, he starts giving geographical directions to where they all need to go. She's, um, she's, I, th I think she even says who, and mm -hmm. he spells it out. H-E-L-M-I-C-K. -C Little yep. girl he, and, you know, wherever. That was taken. Uh-huh. I've so got the audio of like, the last four up another way if you want to try them. So I've got 9, 10, 11, and 12 if you want me to try them. Okay, A let's do 10 one. and 11 just to put that, put that down because it's interesting uh, to hear. Sure. Why did you have to kill her? It got out of hand. I got scared because I, I only God knows, Don. I don't know why. <laughs> so that was ten, and then here comes eleven. But this was the this was the nervy part. This was the high risk part. Uh, Mr. Smith is looking at me, and he knows I have to. I'm thinking of something, and, and John. I said, well, I, I'm thinking of doing. I have an idea. What is it? What do you want to? What do you want to do? Do here? I said. I said. Uh, I sense when he was calling, he was fixating on Dawn, and so I'd like to to work with Dawn, uh, to, so that when he calls, she can 
She knows how to keep them on the telephone long enough so that we can do a traps and trace. In the old days, traps and traces, it would be, you have to keep them on about 15 minutes on the phone, it's a long, it's a long time. So I'll work with her there. But I also want, I'm like using her as a, a decoy. I'm using her to, to, to kind of, you know, lasso in this guy, this guy. And, and, and Mr. Smith tells me, he says, is there any chance my, I'm going to lose my other daughter here? And I, I said, no. I said, we'll give her the protection. This, don't worry about that. Talking and explaining how he had to come to the family and felt a certain kind of way about it. I mean, he knew how this might feel to them when he says, basically, now your one daughter is gone and murdered. I need to use your other daughter as bait for this guy. Um, and so he very specifically tells the father that it's going to be safe and that they will make sure that, every, you know, she's very protected. Um, so as we said on the very last call, at the very end of it, he does say, you know, whoop, do you know Deborah Helmick? And that was huge. And that's exactly what they had hoped, you know, unfortunately, that he would say because he'd give the information. And he immediately starts spitting out directions geographically, just as he did when he told them where to find Sherry. Um, again, down to the steps, the call was traced to 50 miles away. No one was there. They followed the directions he gave while on the phone. And they find themselves about 10 miles from where Sherry was found, from where Sherry's body was found. This time, it was the body that they do believe to be little Deborah's. Her parents did confirm her identity based on the clothing she was wearing. Um, but they found something odd when they started to further assess her and took her in for the autopsy. She was wearing all of her clothing, but on top of her regular clothing, she had on a pair of uh, women's underwear like that weren't hers on top of her own. Mm. Uh, so she wasn't missing anything in fact, she had something extra on. Uh, John Douglas has said that he long had said that he didn't think that this guy was new to this kind of game, to these kinds of crimes. And he thinks that this underwear is potentially evidence from another victim. Um, so it's now time for the graveside memorial for Sherry that they've already publicized on the news that garnered the phone call that they just got. Uh, no luck. The it, it comes and goes. Now Deborah's funeral is going to be the next day. No one stood out in particular for that one. Uh, but then you finally get what looks like it could be a lead. So results finally start to come back from the testing of the letter that uh, the family had received. If you remember the last will and testament from Sherry. So finally, they've, they've been doing all this uh, with what technology was available in 1985, and, and they've used what they had. And so uh, they use technology called electrostatic detection apparatus. It's called the ESDA. If you picture, it's much more technical than this, but I'm going to dumb it down. It's essentially, and Drew speak on this, but I would consider it like a crayon leaf rubbing is basically yeah, that's it that's basically that's it. essentially yeah. i mean it, there's more technology involved but that's kind of if you can picture it what it does so it's going to pick up uh what's been etched into paper that you don't see visible um and, so, and so that's what they use mm -hmm. yeah they, they found the notepad and they they use the piece of paper but you're right they just lay a piece of plastic over it and somehow um they 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 like soak it in something first though. I can't remember what it is. It's like, yeah, it cadmium says, or, you know, just something like that, like a chemical, not even a chemical, but like a powder. Mm -hmm. And then when they, so it looks like a blank piece of paper to the naked eye, but when you put a piece of plastic over and you start, uh, you remember the, the magnetic old man. Yeah. You remember that Yeah, <laughs> with the little magnet shavings, that's mm -hmm. basically what it does. So they, they you're, you're dead on with the crayon leaf thing. It, it just, it, it, it creates an image for you to be able to see. And they figured out what the phone number was from there. Yeah. From something that's essentially been embossed. So yeah, they find um, on that when the, when this results come back, a, a partial grocery list and a phone number, this phone number um, has an area code that an area code in the first three digits that lead them to Huntsville, Alabama. It's missing one, excuse me, it's missing one digit, um, but all of the rest are there. So, uh, so that's, so they've deciphered again, like I said, Huntsville, Alabama. So they track this number down. They use all the algorithms to take this one, you know, number that's one digit short and trace it down to a guy named Joe Shepard. So now they think, is this the killer? Uh, who knows? But 
is this someone who knows the killer? Maybe, right? Because this number is written down there. So they obtain a warrant for Joe Shepard's uh, phone records. And they see that a call has actually been made to his phone from nearby Lexington, near Lake Murray. So Lexington County is where Sherry Smith was abducted and murdered. And a phone call had been incoming to Joe's phone from that area. Um, so there it says they finally get in touch with Joe. So Joe tells them that this is from his parent. This is his parents' house, his parents' phone number. So their house is only two miles from where Deborah's body was found. The second victim, they immediately use, um, they go on to Joe's parents' house. I mean, now they're elated. This is the first big thing they found. Finally so they, a they break, right. Yeah, finally a break. So they haul it to Joe's parents' house. Just, I'm going to break that down one more time. So they find on the piece of paper that the victim had was a phone number. They tracked to, it's a, a guy named Joe Shepard. He says, oh, they look at his phone records. There's phone records from a place where these bodies had been found. He said, oh, that's that's my parents' phone number. So, okay, so here they go, all in tow to parents' house. So they get to Joe's father's, and they start talking to his father, and uh, his name is Ellis, and Ellis was an electrician. So immediately they're like, oh, my goodness. Like he was, that's, that was part of the profile was this Vic, this uh, suspect was likely an electrician or a contractor. But they also realized right off the rip that Ellis was not their guy between his age um, the way he conducted himself, his mannerisms, his cadence, all of the things, it, it, it was not going to be their guy. And um, the way he interacted with his wife, he was still happily married to, which is also not part of the profile. And on top of all of that, Ellis and his wife were out of town uh, during the murder of both of these girls. So they physically were not present. Um, so they start talking to him though. And they say, look, here's what we've got. This is how we obtained your number. This is what we're looking at. We're trying to figure this out. Do you know anyone like this? Would anyone be in contact with you that would be like this and start giving them um, essentially they're the bullet points of their analysis of the, the, their profile of the suspect immediately Ellis and his wife, they looked at each other and had like a ding, ding, ding moment. And they were all both like, yeah, we, that's Larry Jean Bell. We know him. He's an electrician that works for me. He was house sitting while we were out of town. So now it's like, oh, goodness. and okay. I'm sure the, the agents and law enforcement officers were like, oh my God, this is definitely him because he's got three names. Like, <laughs> well, that's what really did it, Drew. Yeah, I They actually was... called off the search for any evidence. They didn't, did, they didn't did, even. Excuse me. Did you say Larry Jean Bell? And that's like, him. We've okay, got our guy. Done deal. <laughs> that's the way it goes. Exactly. Exactly. So they say it's Larry Jean Bell, electrician that works with them. Um, so they said that, so they were gone for six weeks, uh, traveling for six weeks. And for that six weeks time, Larry Jean Bell, uh, I believe he goes by Jean was, uh, their house sitting for them. Uh, so they said that when they got back though, you know, we always do this like later. Hmm. It's funny you say that. Cause now that I think of it, right. They're like, yeah, you know, when we got back home, he looked so different. He had lost a ton of weight. It had been six weeks. Um, he lost a ton of weight. He'd grown a beard. His hair was kind of disheveled. And all he could do was talk about the abduction and murders of these two girls. He even had newspaper clippings that he showed them. And you would like to think that if your friend or coworker, maybe they're a little obsessed with the news, but if they're pulling out clippings that they've saved, right? Like I'm not faulting them. I mean, I'm sure they're just like, this guy's kind of weird, whatever. He probably was always a little bit weird, but I mean, like when you're flipping the pancakes and this guy's telling you the story, I mean, it, there's got to be a point where you're like, did yeah, you say, like, and did you hear this about girl? the case? <laughs> right. Did you, did you say did you, found in the woods? You, look what I got right here. Did you see this is clipping? Yeah. <laughs> so weird. Yeah. None of that's yeah. <laughs> So, um, so red flag, red flags abound. Um, so Ellis starts to look through the house um, at the recommendation of authorities to see if anything is off kilter or whatever. And so he realizes that the only thing he can notice that's a little different is he can't find his gun. And so they have him call Gene and they call Gene Bell 
And Jean said, oh, yeah, no, it's there. I just moved it. It's actually under the mattress in the guest bedroom where I slept. Okay, innocuous yeah. enough. So he said, Jean said, look, I, I had a... I'd abducted a so nine-year-old girl and I didn't want her playing with the game. Uh, I did, didn't want her playing with your gun. So I put yeah, it under the I mattress. Had, I had to put it away. It was just safety, really. Yeah. So they look under the mattress and sure enough, there is the gun. There was like the gun and like a pornographic magazine. But then as they look a little closer, uh, when they pull the sheets back, it looked like the mattress pad was covered in what appeared to be a mixture of uh, blood, urine, and semen. Uh, now I will tell you, I've looked and looked and looked, it, it's moot at this point. It doesn't matter, but it draws me crazy. Kind of not knowing I can't find where they tested that or if they, t I, there's nothing else that says definitively. Have you seen that? No, I haven't, but let's remember it was 86, 85, yeah. 86 and 92 ish is probably. Well, I knew we 92 is when that stuff starts coming out. So I guess it doesn't matter because yeah, they, but, whatever, they wrapped it up before 92. So I don't, and I'm trying to think of if they would have even collected the fluid. I'm sure they would have collected the fluid. I, I think they were, they are analyzing hair fibers and stuff at that well, point. So, so I mean, they do. So as they continue to look in that room, so yeah, that the, the uh, mattress pad looked that way, but everything else was meticulous. It had been swept, vacuumed, you know, cleaned. Everything was very, very clean. But they go and they find a bag of clothing that belonged to, uh, to that belonged to Jean Bell. Which okay, fine, he was staying there. But when they move it underneath, that was a bag of uh, women's underwear, multiple, multiple styles and variations of women's underwear. Uh, not saying that it belonged to other women. Maybe it's what he used to put on the girls. Who knows? But multiple styles, and one of the styles and variations was exactly one, just like little Deborah had found that was on her. So they found that they go in the bed, in the bathroom, excuse me. And in the bathroom, they do find six blonde hairs that they retrieved that later we find out um, the best testing they had at the time was that they deemed them uh, microscopically indis indistinguishable or microscopically, essentially as best they could, they pinned it to the girls, to uh, Deborah and Cherry, because no one else in that family also, a side note, had blonde hair. Um, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say, you know, he, he might have almost gotten away with this if he had properly used uh, Manscaped beard trimmer. So if he had gone to Manscaped.com and, and dealt with the uh, website where he would get beard shampoo and conditioner, maybe even some beard oil, he might be feeling a little bit better about himself. He can get away with his, his crimes because he would be clean shaven. He would be smooth as a ba baby's bottom. And again, uh, the DNA wasn't that prevalent yet. The, the the face was. So he could have, in theory, gone to uh, manscaped.com and used the code, the promo code Wolfpack for 20% off. He would have got free shipping. Uh, and that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use that promo code Wolfpack. Aru, let's get back to murder. Aru. Uh, um. I feel like I said I would never say that, but I just did. So again, no one in the house had blonde hair. Uh, so they were able to obtain an arrest warrant from what they have at this point for Jean Bell. So on June 26th, uh, they get him. He denies any involvement. I think he said that their uh, argument was flimsy and he, you know, no, of course not. All of this and that. They do everything they do. They can do to get him to crack. <clears throat> Nothing quite works. I mean, they even bring in Sherry's family to the interrogation room, including Dawn, and and try to use them in a, in the same physical space, and nothing quite works. Um, but so it says. So here's an article from A and E when they had their true crime documentary, where they interviewed John Douglas on this case, um, and they talk about him, the arrest of Gene Bell, and the face to face interview, and they say, how did that play out, and. They say the sheriff's police said to Bell, uh, do you know who these boys are? These boys are from the FBI. And Mr. Douglas has a profile that fits you to a T. And said, he's just looking at me. He said, I told him I develop a program on criminal profiling for the FBI. One of the things I found is that people who talk, <clears throat> people that we talk to, they make it seem dreamlike, like they did a crime, but they don't remember doing it. It's kind of like two sides of their personality. They have a good side and a bad side. And it says, then I asked, when did you start feeling bad about this case? 
Uh, so that's what John Douglas asked to the man who's been arrested, Gene Bell. And he said, when I saw the cemetery, I didn't feel good about it. And he said, I asked, what about it? And Bell said, all I know is that the good Larry Gene Bell couldn't have done this, but bad Larry Gene Bell could have. And he mm -hmm. said that would be the closest that they ever got to a confession from him. Um, and John Douglas, in fact, went on to testify in court uh, with this, with what I'm reading to you here. Um, so he was put on trial. He was finally convicted in 1986. Uh he was executed via electric chair in in 1996, October 4th, I believe, 96. And he was given the choice of lethal injection or electric chair. Um, and at the time, electric chair was still deemed worse than lethal injection. And he picked that. And it's interesting because um, John Douglas says, uh, he says, we've had cases. It says, what is different about Larry Jean Bell? Um, something was different to him. You know, it, it caused him to write a book on, on this case specifically. This one bothered him a whole lot. And he's seen some pretty bad stuff. And he said, we've had cases like the Zodiac Killer who would communicate with the police, but not with the families. Nothing like this. Um, Bell was sadistic, not only to the victims, but to the surviving victims, the mother, the father, and the daughter. I hope I never see another one like that again. He said, from my perspective, the death penalty was justified with him. I was surprised he had a choice how he could die, and he took the worst one, the electric chair. He could have taken the needle. Uh, he said, Bill lived a life of hell in prison, so at the end, rather than go the easy way, he chose electrocution. It was probably his way of showing what a tough guy he thought he was. Well, it's also a testament to his uh, devotion to the profession, uh, since he was, he was an electrician. indeed an electrician. So. Perhaps that was it. Maybe they just handed him a, a, a pair of channel dikes and said, okay, cut the red wire. Cut the red wire. And the, But they didn't turn the breaker off. The you know, I used to think electrocution sounded like the most horrible thing ever, but seeing some of the botched up lethal injections, I might choose electrocution at this point. Like, I think, oof. anyway. So I'm, I'm, we, I'm just working hard not to get on death row. I am. That <laughs> is an day, irrational fear of mine. Every day I do something to make sure that I don't get on death row. So real quick, guys, and we're going to wrap it up. It's getting late. Uh, but where this gets really sideways and really interesting is that, uh, you know, I had said earlier that John Douglas thinks that he might be responsible, this guy, for three other uh, uh, cold cases, basically. Uh, there are two for sure. And we might talk about these in a separate. I'm kind of thinking it, it won't be today, but in a separate show. One, it was Denise Porch, <clears throat> excuse me, and Sandy Cornett. Sandy Cornett was actually the girlfriend of a co-worker of um, Bell's. And then Denise Porch, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, lived like 200 feet. That might have been Sandy, 200 feet from his condo at the time where he lived. Back to their profile, though, he was actually, uh, had been married. Bell had gotten married early on, had a son, got a divorce, joined the Marines briefly, uh, got, uh, he was discharged when he accidentally shot himself. Shot meaning, himself. I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it fits everything they said about, you know, probably had been married and divorced and, uh, all of these things. Uh, he had been slightly overweight, like they named, he just lost the weight once he, uh, had started committing the murders. That's when he started getting a little bit less meticulous, started really ramping up. And I would be willing to guess almost looking like he was almost looking like a spree could have been what was going to happen here pretty soon based on his um, dishevelment and starting to kind of unravel. We saw that with Ted Bundy, like he went and the, the college kids after he was already on trial and it was like, boom, boom, like things that were out of his nature. He had been right. pretty organized until that point, but anyway, so, and started getting sloppy and just like needing to hurry up and like, couldn't again, couldn't satiate that uh, Ted Bundy equated it to like alcoholism. Basically like he needed, he, he needed, more and more to get the fix quicker and quicker. Like it wasn't, nothing was tidying him over as well anymore. But this guy kind of seems like he was going down that path. Who knows? We will look into those other two cases. And I just found out that the Q Center that I mention all the time, that's based here where I am, that the Community United Effort that looks into cold cases and, um, and victims, uh, I didn't realize, but they've actually already been doing some investigations on um, – Denise Porch, so because she was here out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and she is potentially one of Bell's victims. So I might well, reach out to them. But yeah, 
It's interesting. I bet he's got more out there though. I bet some cold cases that we, you know, that haven't been solved or um, some of his victims, I would say. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that was an amazing story. It still is. It still is. It still is. He was electrocuted. He was killed by electrocution. Uh, pretty quickly, I would say. I would say yeah, 10 yeah, years was a pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think he probably did. He probably waived a lot of appeals, I would think. He appealed quite often. And but he never had grounds, and he then of course did the eleventh hour appeal directly beforehand. But um, he did he did garner some appeals for sure. It it just seems like another measure of control. Like okay, I'm ready now. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we'll go, uh, I'll go because I'm ready now. You know, I almost feel like I see some like antisocial personality behavior in him in the sense of, um, you know how they can, like almost be a chameleon or kind of like mask other like what someone wants to hear. And so like the more he would talk a lot to them about God and talk to a lot to them about um, the heavenly father and how he and Sherry would be together, but he had no other instances in his life where he spoke spiritually or religiously. So it's like he was doing that with them to like garner their, their trust or their talk or, you know, whatever um, I could be mm -hmm. told. Look, I, I don't know what I don't know. That's not my field, but that's what it sounds like a little bit. Wow. Um, as uh, as we move, uh, move on, speaking of the Q Center, I, I want to ask you publicly, uh, since uh, we have 48 people in the chats and there'll be plenty of people listening, will you do an episode of the rest of the story with Drew Breezy with me where we discuss your first interaction with the Q Center and how you helped solve the case i know you spoke a little bit about it on the uh the bar is open podcast that you recently did i did uh, oh you listen oh Drew. i did i wanted to hear the whole story though and i even i even heard that you kind of reserved like you were kind of saving that for, for mm -hmm. i will for i will you will get the exclusive i want to get the scoop and i want to be able yeah. to put put you front and center on patreon and if you haven't joined our Patreon, please feel free to do so. We hate nickel and diming you, but it really does kind of keep the lights on. Uh, in Eric Tanzi, we joked at the beginning of this, we didn't know about the future of his uh, uh, employment here at Failure to Stop. It's uh, basically he was just working on the studio, so I'm subbing in for him tonight. He's probably finishing up with that. He will start uh, oh, probably oversharing on patreon it's going to get really good he's going to start reading chapters from his book and he has some great interviews set up but i have a jewel a gem of an interview set up with andrea up late and we're going to talk about her role we'll do it all Absolutely. right well I'm this proud. was a great case it was it was it was really good i'm glad that you hopped on um in my moment of desperation i really appreciate it and i uh, enjoyed having you on I enjoyed being here, even even through the time of the month uh, humor that you tried to bring us down. Special with. days. So special days. We are going to have a very special day tomorrow because it's uh, Josh's turn in the barrel. He's going to be with Eric on Last Call. So watch that live if you're a member on YouTube. I think that they're going to feed the audio into Patreon. We're, we're working through a few bugs on that. We're trying to get that. What we're trying to do also is get a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff, like before we go live, because... <laughs> Today that's would have been the gold. magic happens. Today would have been comedy gold, and that's where the <laughs> magic happens. So, uh, until then, unless you have anything else, uh, you'll see John and I soon enough on uh, Com Center. We have a banger of a show this week, though. There's talk that there may be a Comedian involved, and then uh, Friday is going to be even better. And then <laughs> the cycle just starts. The, start, the cycle just starts all over again, and I don't mean that kind of cycle. Please, get your mind out of the gutter. Uh, until next time, uh, John, stick around. Andrea, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. We'll see you all soon. Guns up. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Giddy up.